Hajjan Nibu and uh, for, for organizing this visit and Neelaj Prabhu also for hosting me and so many of the devotees who organized the programs. Uh, yesterday Mahasundi Mataji organized a wonderful program at uh, Dell. Um, that was uh, uh, lots of fun to do on campus. So, um, <coughs> so uh, today's uh, seminar topic is uh, called, officially called uh, um, Offering for seeking forgiveness, offering forgiveness. Lessons from the Srimad Bhagavatam. Okay, so seeking forgiveness, offering forgiveness in both directions. How do we seek forgiveness for a wrong that we've done? And how do we give a forgiveness? How do we forgive for something that we've, um, someone who's wronged us? Okay, and uh, I'll try to base the seminar on the Srimad Bhagavatam uh, that we can see some lessons uh, there. Uh, the, uh, uh, the way I'm going to structure it is that we've got two sessions. Uh, the first session ends at 4, although we started a little late, I think, so maybe a few minutes more. Uh, and um, that, uh, that first part is about uh, seeking forgiveness. And then uh, after the break, we'll have a little break in between, then the second session is about um, uh, forgiving. And then tomorrow at the Sunday feast, uh, we're going to talk about Krishna's quality of forgiveness. Okay? Mm -hmm. And so that's a standalone one. And if you've attended this seminar, you'll appreciate more. But for people who haven't attended and are just coming from the sun for the Sunday program, they can also um, understand. But it will be a continuation of what we're doing today. Okay? So that's the plan. And hopefully there will be a chance to ask uh, questions and so on. Let's see how much time there is. I'll try to be. Um, succinct in what I have to say. So please repeat. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya 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 so let's start uh, the seminar with a story. It's always good to begin with stories. And this is a story that I think many of you will have heard before. But this time, if you've heard the story before, or if you haven't, either way, please listen to the story with the intention of, while asking the question in your mind, who is to blame? in this whole turn of events, okay? So this is the story of Jai and Vijay, okay? And as you listen to the story, ask yourself, who's at fault? Who's to blame? So one day, the four Kumaras, these are four little boys who are sages. They're the sons of Brahma, and therefore, some of the, they're, they're the oldest living beings on this planet, practically speaking. But they always look like little children, because they decided not to grow up. How old are you? I'm 10. You're 10. Okay, so you're a little too old to be one of the Kumaras, but <laughs> they were about five or six, is my understanding, <laughs> something like that. Uh, but they didn't want to grow up any more than that, and the reason is because that's an age of great innocence, and uh, all the material desires that emerge later on in life uh, don't, aren't there yet. So these four Kumaras uh, decide one day that they want to go see Lord Vishnu. Uh, they have heard about him. Uh, many times, and they're curious. So because they're the sons of Brahma, and because they're so pure-hearted, they can actually do this when they want to. And so they head out to, toward the spiritual world, and um, come to the gates of Vaikuntha. Vaikuntha has seven gates, and they are able to pass unobstructed through the first six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Srila Vallabhacharya, in his commentary on Srimad Bhagavatam, just as an aside, he says that these six gates represent the six opulences of Krishna. The first six. Uh, you know Krishna's six opulences, all strength, all beauty, all knowledge, all renunciation, like that, all fame. Uh, huh? I forgot what that thing is. All strength. All strength. Uh, all well. So all of these six, and because they did not have any desire for these six opulences, 
they were able to pass through the six gates without being stopped. In fact, not only were they not stopped, but they did not even see the gatekeepers who stand guard at these six gates. So each one of the seven gates has a pair of gatekeepers who stand guard there. And they weren't stopped, they weren't obstructed, they didn't even see the security that was present. But at the seventh gate, which Vallabhacharya says represents bhakti, uh, which they did not yet have, they were still impersonalists. Not mayavadi, they weren't against the Lord, but they just didn't have any appreciation for the Lord's form and his beauty and all of that. So they were stopped. Jay and Vijay were the gatekeepers, and they blocked the way with their clubs. And they got really upset, actually. Bhagavatam says that their eyes flared up in anger, their eyes became reddish and their nostrils flared up and you know when someone gets really angry, you could see it on their facial features. And they said, stop, who do you think you are that you're just going to waltz in and go see the Lord of the Universe, Vishnu? Not anyone can go. Now, um, they looked at these boys and they saw four little naked boys that just seemed like they had wandered into Vaikuntha with no purpose and no appointment. Uh, and so they stopped them, but the Kumaras were not willing to be stopped. So they got really angry, they got really upset, and they said, you too, Jai and Vijay, see distinctions, you discriminate in that place where there is no discrimination. You demonstrate fear in that place where there should be no fear. What is there to be, to be afraid of in the Lord's abode in Vaikuntha? Krishna is all powerful. He's more than capable of protecting himself and no one can enter Vaikuntha unless they're ready. So what are you afraid of? Why are you stopping us? It's only because you have not conquered these enemies of lust, anger, and greed. These enemies that properly belong to people in the material world, not up here in the spiritual world. And therefore you don't deserve to stay here. We curse you to go down into the material world. As soon as Jai and Vijay hear this curse, they immediately fall down on the ground uh, and touch the feet of the Pumaras and beg for their forgiveness. We're so sorry for what we've done. Uh, please forgive us. Uh, don't destroy us. And the only thing they pray for, uh, they have one prayer. It's very interesting. Uh, it's not, the prayer is not, let me not go down to the material world. That's not what they're praying for. Do you know what their prayer is? Anyone remember? What they ask Krishna or the Kumaras for? Please do not put us in a circumstance where we might forget the Lord. Whatever circumstance we have to go to, it's okay. You want to send us to the material world, you want to send us to hell, it doesn't matter. Just don't put us in a place where we will forget Krishna. And so in fact, that's what happens. They come down to the material world and they take three births as demons. Um, Hiranyakashipu and Hiranyaksha, Ravana in Kumbhakarna, and Shishupala in Kumbhakarna. And then we hear from Chaitanya Dila that they optionally, they take the option of uh, taking a fourth birth as Jaga and Madhai, just because they want to participate in Mahaprabhu's pastimes. So they come in each one and they become demons, which means they're totally against the Lord, and they're trying to kill him, but they're always conscious of Krishna. No one thinks of the Lord as intensely as the demons do, other than the great devotees. So it's either you can be a devotee or you can be a demon. Um, they're both glorious in some sense, because they're both thinking of Krishna. It's the in-between range which is miserable. People like us, where we can neither remember Krishna nor can we hate Krishna. He's just irrelevant in our lives. Right? We don't really need you, Krishna. You stay in your cubicle and I'll stay in mine. Right? <laughs> so when we have that attitude, then we're destined to, to, uh, to stay in the cycle of material existence. 
But either way, whether we love Krishna or hate Krishna, being conscious of him is a good thing. And since the option of being Krishna's devotee was not available to them, because they were cursed, uh, so they chose the option of being demons, where they could remember Krishna. Uh, so, um, that's their destiny, right? But the story isn't over. As soon as uh, this curse is pronounced on Jain Vijay, the Lord, Vishnu, he's in Vaikuntha, he starts to panic. He becomes very worried. And he runs out on foot. He comes running out to the gates of Vaikuntha, the seventh gate, to see what's going on, to see the Kumaras and see his devotees. And our Acharyas explain that um, two things. One is that the Lord is not coming on the back of Garuda as he normally does. When he wants to get from place to place, he flies on his eagle carrier, Garuda. But he's not coming on Garuda because he's in too much of a rush. Uh, so he leaves Garuda behind. And in fact, the Bhagavatam describes that Garuda is so eager to serve the Lord that he's running behind Krishna. <laughs> or Vishnu. Vishnu is too fast. Lord Narayan is too fast, and so he's running behind him. And when he <laughs> finally catches up, then Lord Narayan is very kind, and he puts his arm on his shoulder, Bhagavatam describes. He's got one arm on Garuda's shoulder, as a way of kind of saying, yeah, it's okay, I accept your service. I saw you were running, and I was in too much of a rush, sorry. But he's still accepting Garuda's service by using him as a, as a resting place for his arm. And... He has no sandals on. The Bhagavatam does not describe the Lord's slippers, even as it describes his form. And so the Acharyas again say that Krishna was in so much of a rush that he forgot to uh, put on his chaplas. Now, why all this rush? Because he promises in Bhagavad Gita, right? Kshipram bhavati dharmatma shashva chantin nigachati kaunteya pratijanihi name bhakta pranashya. He says, my dear Arjun, you declare it boldly in this world that my devotee never perishes. And Krishna says that verse right after another very important verse, where he says, Apichet sudurachalo bhajate maam ananyabha sadhureva samantabhya samyarpya vasidhovisa. He says, even if my devotee has done something terrible, durachara, that person is so durachara, very bad. Even then, we should consider that person a sadhu. Why? Because their heart, their intelligence, is in the right place. Their determination is still to serve me. And we'll discuss this verse more tomorrow. But that's what Krishna says. And then in the next verse he says, Kshipram bhavati dharmatma. Such a person who has that conviction quickly becomes dharmatma. They quickly become good and religious, and properly situated again. And therefore, Name Bhakta Pranashati, my devotee never perishes. So having given that promise, even if we assume that Jain Vijay had done something very bad, Sudurachata, even then Krishna says, no, I have to protect them. So he's in great anxiety about Jain Vijay, and he runs out, and he starts off, well, first of all, the four Kumaras see Lord Vishnu. And the Lord, another reason he's coming barefoot, actually, the Acharyas explain that it's because uh, he thinks the Kumaras are here, they are so eager to see my lotus feet. This is why they came here, this is why they got so angry. So let me not cover my feet with any shoes. If they see my feet, they'll be satisfied, they'll calm down, and maybe the situation will be diffused. So as soon as he comes, the four Kumaras see Lord Vishnu. And they are overjoyed. They're overcome with happiness. Shubhadeva Goswami describes that they're looking at Krishna's form, Lord Vishnu's form. Uh, they look at his lotus feet and how beautiful they are. And when the fragrance of the Tulasi that has been offered to the feet of Krishna. Tasya Ravinda, Nayanasya Padaravinda, Kinjal Kamisha Tulasi, Makaranda Vayu. 
अंतर्गतस्वरेण चकार these four boys, when the fragrance of the tulsi offered at Krishna's feet enters their nostrils, antargata swavivarena. What does it do? Sankshobham aksharajusham apichitatango. In their heart and mind, it causes sankshobha, it means uh, trembling, unsteadiness. In the hearts and minds of those who are akshara jushan, these four boys have always been fixed in the peace of Brahman. They have achieved complete happiness and peace and satisfaction. They've never felt any anxiety. This is why they stay to, for, as little boys, right? So they wouldn't have to experience the agitation, that's sanchova, agitation of the senses. This is the first time in their life that their peace of mind is broken because of the Lord's beauty. Because of the Lord's, not even His beauty, but the fragrance that comes from the Tulsi mixed with the fragrance of His lotus feet, actually. It's two fragrances, the fragrance of Tulsi and the, mixed with the fragrance of His own lotus feet. Krishna's feet smell nice, okay? Our feet, <laughs> not so nice. <laughs> if you've ever smelled your dirty socks, <laughs> not good, right? But Krishna's lotus feet have their own fragrance. He doesn't need perfume to mask it. Uh, the Acharyas make this point very clearly that it is not Tulsi that is masking the fragrance of Krishna's lotus feet. Rather, Krishna's feet have their own fragrance that is mixed with the Tulsi that's offered, which makes it even better. So the Kumaras look at his feet. Then they go up and they look at his lotus face. And then they look down again at their feet. And Bhagavatam says they don't know where to look. It's, <gasps> everywhere they look, it's just Krishna so beautiful. Maybe you've had this experience in um, like visiting Vrindavan Dham, for example. You see Radha Shams in the, if you've been there. And you don't know where to look. Like everything you look at their face is so beautiful. You look at uh, Radharani's delicate hands, they're so beautiful. You look at Krishna's pose, it's so beautiful. You look at their feet, and you don't know where to look. Every inch is beautifully decorated with nice painting and flower decoration. So the mind becomes overwhelmed, it becomes confused. Right? But something else is happening to the Kumaras also. As they're seeing Krishna, their hearts are becoming purified. Their bhakti is awakening for the Lord. And Krishna starts off very strategically. Lord Narayan, he says, he addresses first the Kumaras. He says, you are um, Brahmins. You are uh, learned sages. Therefore, you are worshipable. Even for me. And Krishna says, go Brahmana hitayata. Dedicated to Brahminical culture. So he says, and my people have offended you. Because they are my servants, therefore the offense belongs to me. So at the start of the story, the Jai and Vijay immediately took blame for what had happened. They fell to the ground and said, We're so sorry for what we did. Now Krishna is showing up, and he's taking blame for the situation. He's saying, actually, they're my people, their misbehavior is my responsibility. So I'm very sorry about that. Whatever you want me to do to make you happy, I'm ready to do. Even if you want me to cut off both of my arms, if that would make you happy, I'm ready to do that. He's expressing his dedication. But he's also giving a very subtle message here to them. His two arms are who? Jan and Vijay. He's saying, even if you want me to cut off my arms and throw them away, I'm ready to do that for you. He's giving them an indirect message. He's saying, this is what you've done to me. These are my devotees. They're very dear to me. And they're like my arms. They protect me. 
and you've just cut them off. You want to do that? Okay. So the Kumaras immediately get the message. Because they're advanced, right? They're sages. They immediately understand. And they feel very regretful. And then they start to beg forgiveness. They say, my dear Lord, we are so foolish that we have cursed these two innocent men who do not deserve this curse. Whatever punishment you want to give us, we're ready to take. Now it's the third person who's taken blame. First it was Jay Then Lord Vishnu came and took the blame on himself. And now the Gumanas are saying, no, it's our fault. We curse those who are innocent. It's us who have uncontrolled who anger. We shouldn't have done that. They were just doing their duty. They were just doing their job. So, uh, Krishna then, he says, actually, in the end, this is all my plan. He says, he says I've arranged this whole thing because this was all destined to be. Actually, he gives this little tantalizing tidbit that long time ago, Lakshmi Devi came to Vaikuntha and I was sleeping. And Jai and Vijay stopped her from entering. And so she cursed them that one day you're going to end up in the material world. You'll lose your service. So now ultimately it's Lakshmi Devi's fault. <laughs> we don't know the whole background of the story. We this little tidbit. Uh, so the blame is all being passed around. But ultimately, Krishna says, This is my, all my plan. I want to do pastimes. I want to do Lila in the material world. For that, I need good opponents. I need uh, good uh, demons to fight with. Uh, and so they're going down to this material world. Uh, and he says, Ultimately, it's all my plan. The buck always stops with Krishna. He's ultimately responsible mm -hmm. for everyone. So think about it. Um, typically, in this world, when there's a few things that are very significant here. One is that the Bhagavatam is describing a situation where things are really complicated. It's not clear who's exactly to blame for the situation. right? I mean, initially, when it starts off, it's very clear. And we can, we can, uh, we can uh, force clarity into the situation. We can insist. We can take sides. And we can say, uh, it's really obvious what's happening. Jain Vijay made a mistake. They stopped the Kumaras, who shouldn't have been stopped. And even Krishna agrees with them. So they're the ones that yeah, yes, but that's only part of the picture. Right? The Kumaras also lost their cool a little too quickly. I mean, they're sages. You expect them to be calm and to assess the situation, to forgive. Bhagavatam says that forgiveness is the crest jewel of the quality of a brother. One who is wise, who's a sage, this is the crest jewel of their qualities, is forgiveness. So they should have been quick to forgive. Why did they curse? They're to blame. And we could take sides. Or we could point the finger at Krishna and say, he knows everything. And he's sitting inside in Vaikuntha on Ananda Shesh, relaxing while his devotees are suffering here, fighting with each other. He's the one who's to blame. But the picture is very complicated. Right? There's, it's not clear. And with this, the Bhagavatam is giving us a very good message that in this world, when there are situations re requiring forgiveness, it's never clear. It's never easy to figure out who started it, who's exactly at fault, what was the situation that led to it, who overreacted. It's very complicated, number one. And number two, the Bhagavatam is describing how those who are devotees of the Lord, who are of good character, who are sane, how they respond in such a situation. That initially, 
everyone points fingers. You did this, you did this, like the Kumaras did, like Jai Vijay did. Stop, who do you think you are? The Jai Vijay are, oh, stop, who do you think you are to stop us? And so on and so forth. But in the end, where you see the wonderful Vaishnav character emerge is that everyone ended up fighting not for being right, but, but for being wrong. Everyone was fighting to take blame. No, it's my fault. No, it's my fault. Actually, I should have behaved better. And that's what makes it uh, an exemplary story, is that you have people who make mistakes, even in Vaikuntha. Even in Vaikuntha, even the sons of Brahma, even pure devotees who are eternal associates of Krishna, their his Nitya Parshadas, are able to make mistakes. And yet, it's not the fact that they make the mistake which is shocking. People often emphasize the wrong end of this story. Oh, this is shocking. Jai and Vijay could make a mistake and fall. Oh, this is shocking. The Kumaras could curse like that. That's not what's shocking. That's human. That's the nature of the jiva, of the living entity is we make mistakes. This is why we're not Krishna. This is why we're not God. It's because the living entity is always prone to make mistakes. We're, we're jiva, we're, we're jivatma, we're anu. We're very, very small, we're weak. That's not what's shocking about the story, the fall down. What's shocking, what's surprising, what's exemplary is the fact that after it happens, how do they recover? The recovery is impressive. Just like when you're flying airlines, right? The, flight, the fact that flights get delayed because of a storm or weather or so on, I mean, that's not shocking. People become angry and they get surprised, but come on, I mean, these are tiny little planes and, and huge skies with major storms. It's good. Things are gonna get delayed. It's about the recovery, right? How quickly does the airline rebook you? Do they give you a hotel to stay overnight? Do they take care of your food and water and all of that? That's the real question, the recovery, not the mistake. Same way here. The recovery was impressive. Every single person said, I'm ready to take blame and tell me what I can do to improve. So, that's kind of setting the scene. Right? There, Bhagavatam is full of stories of forgiveness. We'll mention many more in this seminar. There are many, many. Ambarish and Durvasamuni, another story of forgiveness. Um, anyone remember? Any others? Yeah, Shringi and Parikshad Maharaj. Practically, the Bhagavatam begins with a story of forgiveness. Um, again, we'll get into it. Any others you remember? Vritrasura and Indra. Hmm? and Indra. Uh, and Indra, yes. Lord Brahma. Yes, Brahma and Krishna, right? And close to Brahma, the Mohanila is also Indra's fall down, also his mistake. And um, there's the story of Dhruva, uh, yes. Uh, particularly um, the Dhruva's um, uh, father, Uttanapad, and Suruchi, and their mistake towards Dhruva. Uh, remind me, I don't remember. That he was brought to the, uh, he was brought to the kingdom with a woman. Uh, Rishas from uh, he is uh, like is a say, sage uh, who is in the forest, but he was brought to the uh, kingdom because the kingdom is going to the worst drop in this. Uh, oh. And then he doesn't actually know that he was being brought for that purpose, but finally, uh, though he is. Uh, Things are disturbed, he agrees to do that for the kingdom. Yes, excellent, wonderful story. Uh, there's also um, Daksha and Lord Shiva, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that was a major instance of forgiveness. So, anyway, we'll make references to these stories, and if you're not aware of a particular reference, then you can ask any questions and I'll explain the story more. But uh, I wish I could tell all these stories one after another, but uh, we will go to midnight. So. Okay. So, um, 
But I think Jay and Vijay's story summarizes the whole situation very well. The world is complicated, and it's not about the mistake, it's about the recovery. Okay? And so if we take that as our starting point, and then we say, okay, how do we do that recovery? How do we forgive? And how do we seek forgiveness? So we'll start with the process of seeking forgiveness. Uh, in, um, in the instructions of Bhishmadev to uh, Maharaj Yudhishthir, in the first canto of Bhagavatam, Prabhupada explains in the purport, he says that forgiveness is one of the samanya dharmas for all human beings. So there are different kinds of dharma. Certain kinds of dharma are specific to certain individuals, right? So uh, I have a dharma as a father. My <coughs> children don't have that dharma because they have no children of their own, right? So certain dharmas are certain dharmas are for kshatriyas. They cannot. Um, be afraid in battle. They can't turn their back in battle. But other types of people, Vaishyas, merchants, Brahmins, they can run away from battle. They can hide under the covers if they want. That's not their dharma to be courageous. So everyone has their specific dharma. But certain dharmas are samanya. They're, they're, they're for everyone. They're equally applicable to all people. And uh, and um, and one of these samanya dharmas, uh, Prabhupada says, is forgiveness. The ability to forgive others. To seek forgiveness and to give forgiveness. This is expected of all human beings. Not just Brahmins, Kshatriyas, Vaishyas, everyone. So this is something important for all of us. And this is why Bhagavatam has so many stories about uh, forgiveness. So, the first question is, how do you know when you've done something wrong that requires us to seek forgiveness? This, is, this, this has to be the starting point because it's not easy to recognize when you even need forgiveness, when you need to be forgiven. Most of the time we think we're doing fine and dandy and everything's good. And we don't even realize when we've stepped on someone else's toe. So how do we know? How do we recognize this fact? So there's two aspects of this. One is externally, and the other is internally. Externally speaking, it's very important that we always stay in the company of devotees who are not just formal friends for us, like, Hare Krishna, nice to see you today, and so on, where we just share a sense of formality. Um, uh, we bow to them, they bow to us, but really people who we have enough of a close relationship with that we trust that they will point out a mistake when we do it. Who are open enough with us, whose relationship is close enough that they will be free to speak up if they see some problem with who we are and what we are. This is the key to being successful in any field. You look at very top successful people. They, they, uh, any successful leader is, is someone who does not surround themselves just with yes men. Just people who say, yes sir, yes sir, you're the boss. That's foolish. Of course they're the boss. And of course their decision is the last word. So surrounding yourself with people who, who say, yes sir, yes sir, does no good except feed our egos. Rather, they surround themselves with people who are open, who they tell, you are free to speak your mind. Even when you think, I have done something wrong. I, I, uh, I asked this question to Sachinanda Swami once, many years ago. He said, how, how, how can one remain humble? What's the way to do that? And he said, this very thing. He said, always have a few people in your life who you know that whatever comes out of their mouth, you can trust. Whether it's negative, you did make a mistake here, or whether it's positive. That other side is also important. Because most of the time in this world, you don't know when someone is saying something good about you, whether to trust it or not. Or are they just trying to flatter you because they have something to ask of you? And they need something from you? 
or are they, have you genuinely done something good? So, how do we know when we need forgiveness? We have people around us who can tell us. And for those of us who are living in families, who are married or in close families with parents, which is pretty much everyone here, I think. No, 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 no. For, for us, our families are a very valuable resource in this regard, especially the husband-wife relationship. If we choose to make that relationship in this way, then very often one person's mistake can be pointed out by the partner. It, this happens very naturally because Krishna has given men and women very different uh, perceptual abilities. Uh, we're able to see very different things. And sometimes it happens that you end up you know, saying something to someone and you think, ah, oh, it was just fine, it was a great conversation. And on the car ride back home, your wife says, <laughs> I think that was a little bit strong, what you said. I saw that they felt a little hurt by that. You might smooth things out next time you meet them. And then we have a choice. We can take that seriously, or we can, ah, what does she know? And ignore it out. Same thing in reverse. Krishna has given us, their grass to life is full of challenges. Married life is full of challenges. And spiritual challenges, material challenges, relationship issues. But it comes with some very good benefits as well. It comes with some really special opportunities. I mean, we have to deal with the struggles of Rehasa life anyway. We're not brahmacharis and sannyasis in this room. We might as well take advantage of the benefits that come. And one of the biggest benefits is that we have an inbuilt checks and balances system. If we cultivate our relationships like that, and again, this is a choice, husband and wife, we can choose to create that as a purely hierarchical, silenced relationship. Don't you dare say anything to me. We can choose to do that. But then we're losing one of the greatest assets that we have. All the trouble we put in to take care of each other, we might as well benefit from the good advice, the good words that we can get. And it goes both ways. When your partner praises you, then also you understand, okay, he or she means it genuinely. Because when I don't do something well, then they tell me. So obviously when I do something well, they're not trying to just flatter me. So, um, just on a practical level, for Grihasta, this can be very valuable for husband-wife relationships can be very useful in this regard. One way or the other, externally, we should have people who are able to point things out to us. Well. And then internally, we can know when we've made a mistake. Because Krishna is there in the heart, as the super soul, as the Paramatma. And the presence of the super soul in the heart, in common terms, we call conscience. We all have a conscience. We all, when we do something wrong, it bites us. It makes us, um, we, we don't feel good, we don't feel peaceful at heart. We all have this experience. We do something and just know that just, I just pushed it too far, I did something wrong. Something, for a Prabhupada explains that a, for a good person, for a devotee, there's always that little bite inside when we make a misstep. That's Krishna speaking within our hearts, telling us. Sometimes that voice is not clear, but it's there. You know in the, um, uh, in the episode of Pariksha Maharaj and Shrini, uh, Pariksha Maharaj is in the forest and he's very thirsty and he comes to the uh, uh, 
ashram of a sage. And the sage, uh, sage he wants some water, but the sage is in samadhi, in deep meditation. And so even when Parikshit asks, Shami Krishi doesn't say anything. And because he's hungry and he's thirsty, he loses his temper. And as he's leaving, Maharaj Parikshit finds a dead snake and puts it around the neck of the sage, of Shami Krishi in anger. Shringi, there is son, when he realizes this, he's the son of the sage, he realizes that his father has been insulted in this way. He gets so angry, he pronounces a curse, cursing Maharaj Pariksha to die in seven days. Totally unwarranted, over-the-top curse. Disproportionate for a very small offense, coming from a very elevated person. When she, after Shingi pronounces that curse, he comes in front of his father, who's still in meditation, and he starts crying really loudly. Why is he crying? He just won. I mean, he pronounced a curse that he got his revenge for what had happened to his father. Why is he crying? Prabhupada explained in the purport, he says, because in his heart, Shringi knows that he's done something wrong. And his heart is burning inside. He's feeling pain. And as a child, he doesn't know how to express his remorse, so he just cries. You, you maybe had this experience with children also. They'll knock over a glass of milk, and before you can get angry, they start crying. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't get angry, it's okay. Why are they crying? It's because they're feeling guilty, they're feeling remorseful. They feel bad that they did this. They know it's wrong. So they're being bitten inside. Shingi is the same way. And Prabhupada explains that any good person is going to feel it inside. That's the voice of the super soul. You know when Ambarish Maharaj is insulted um, by Dhruvasa Muni. You know this story? Very famous. Uh, Dhruvas, Ambarish Maharaj is doing a year-long Ikadashi fast. So we do Ikadashi fast for one day. Um, he's doing it for a year. And we just fast from grains and beans. He's fasting without water for a full year. Until next Ikadashi. That next year. The same Ikadashi next year. So he's done, doing a whole year fast. And just before it, the time has come, one year later, that same Ikadashi or Dwadashi has shown up. And it's time to complete his fast and take some food. And you have to do it within a certain time period, according to the city. At that time, Durvasamani shows up. Durvasamani is incredible for his bad time. Always <laughs> 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 does this. <laughs> Actually, it's a contest. Narada Muni is always incredible for his perfect time. <laughs> always shows up just at the right time. Someone's confused. He says, oh, I know what happened. And he'll show up out of nowhere to give the message. Uh, Durvasamani is, is great for his bad time. <laughs> And uh, so he shows up just as he's sitting down to eat. And of course the guest comes, and you have to feed the guest first. And he, Gurvasamani doesn't travel alone. He comes with 10,000 disciples. <laughs> so you have to feed all of them. But of course he has to take a bath before he eats. So off he goes to take his bath, and in the meantime, the tithi is passing, during which you have to break the bath. And so, um, uh, Amrish Mahesh doesn't know what to do. And so he consults with his uh, advisors, with the Brahmins right there. And they say, why don't you take a few drops of water? Water counts as both breaking the fast and not breaking the fast. It's in between. This is why whenever there's a fast, you're not required to fast from water. It's, 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 if you can do it, OK. But if you can't, it's OK. And it's, it's in between. So they say, just take some water, and that'll work. You won't offend. Uh, break the rule of serving your guests first, and you won't lose the time for breaking the fast. So he does that. Durvasa Muni knows, he knows past, present, and future, he's a sage, and he becomes angry, he becomes upset. He loses his temple, temper and plucks some hair from his head, throws it on the ground, utters a curse, and out emerges a demon. And the demon 
runs to curse, uh, sorry, to kill Ambarish Maharaj. Bhagavatam says that Ambarish Maharaj is unmoved. The devotees of the Lord are fearless. And he just stands there, not afraid. Okay, if Krishna, you want to take me today, I'm ready. But Krishna doesn't tolerate, no matter how much the devotees will tolerate. And so he sends his Subhashan Chakra. And he doesn't send it actually, the chakra is always there, it says. It's always there next to Maharaj and it's ready to protect it. And Dravasamuni sees this. Well, first the chakra destroys the demon. And then it says, well, who produced the demon? This <laughs> so then it runs after Maharaj Ambarish. And Ambarish is running all across the three worlds. He goes to all the devas. He goes to Brahma and says, please protect me. And Brahma says, no, stay away before the chakra burns me also. <laughs> and so then he runs to Mahadev, Lord Shiva. And Lord Shiva gives him a very, <laughs> it's really funny actually, <laughs> because the Rasa Muni is there in a panic. <laughs> Please help me, this is burning me. <laughs> Lord Shiva gives him a very philosophical answer about how there's creation, <laughs> <laughs> this universe. And, Actually, I destroy this world, but actually everything is done by Lord Vishnu, and I'm a servant, and <laughs> okay, whatever. <laughs> so, you can just imagine, you can just imagine his state of mind. <laughs> Mahadev is not disturbed, because he's Mahadev. <laughs> so he's not afraid, but he says, I can't help. So he goes to the one to whom the chakra belongs, which is Lord Narayan. Goes all the way to Vaikuntha. And there, in Vaikuntha, he falls at Lord Vishnu's feet and says, you please protect me. If anyone can control the chakra, it's you, because it's your chakra. And what does Lord Vishnu say? He says, I'm so sorry. He says, aham bhakta varadhina. I am not independent, I'm not in control. I am completely dependent upon my devotees. If you want to be saved, my dear Brahman, for your own welfare, Please go and seek forgiveness from the person who you offended. That's the only thing I can suggest for your bed. And so with the Sudarshan Chakra in tow, all the way down, and he falls flat, Arata said, Dandava, like a stick, touching Ambarish Maharaj's feet, and begs for his forgiveness. And then Maharaj Ambarish recites these beautiful prayers to Sudarshan. You can read them in Bhagavad Very nice prayers. It says, Sahasrara Namastubhyam. It says, Oh, you who have a thousand spokes. Oh, you who are Vishnu's personal weapon. Oh, you who are the wheel of time. If I have done any good, pious activity in my life, if I've done any devotional service, please give all those results to this poor Brahma who is burning from the heat that's produced from this chakra. Please forgive me. And so that should immediately pass off. Now, here's the point I wanted to make. That Sudarshan chakra is, a ma a, an aspect of Sudarshan is that he's the wheel of time. He's Kala chakra. This is not everything. This is his aspect in the material world. That he's Kala chakra. The sun is one little aspect of Sudarshan. And the sun is Kala Chakra. Um, um, Ramasenita, how does it go? Yaschakshuresha Savita Sakala Grahana Raja Samasta Suramurti Ashesha Teja Yasyadhyaya Bhavati Samrita Kala Chakra. Right? The sun is Kala Chakra. This is Sudarshan. So Sudarshan is the wheel of time. And time, Bhagavatam says, is the external manifestation of super soul of the Paramatma within our hearts. Paramatma is within our hearts, but he manifests externally as the force of time. This is why Krishna says, Kalosmi, he says, I am time in Bhagavad Gita. So here's the thing. Ambarish Maharaj had the chakra chasing him all throughout the world. But we've got that chakra also that chases us. The super soul is within our hearts. That's the conscience that we hear, that bites us. And when we make a mistake, 
that requires forgiveness, until we seek that forgiveness, we cannot be peaceful. We can run all across the three worlds. We can run away to the Bahamas and find a little you know, island to live on ourselves. And yet, the Sudarshan Chakra will chase us to every corner of the globe. Why? Because that's the Lord within our heart. That's the super soul. And for the sincere devotee, Krishna keeps tapping, keeps knocking. He won't let us sleep peacefully until our hearts are cleansed, until they're free of that guilt. So seeking forgiveness is in our own benefit. It's not that by seeking forgiveness we're benefiting the person whom we have done something wrong to, or the person who feels offended. Yes, it helps them also. But it's worth doing it just for ourselves. Because we can be peaceful. We can be satisfied. We can chant nicely with a clear heart. Because we've asked, we've sought forgiveness. So we should listen. We should listen to that voice in the heart. There's no need to crush it, to hide it, to suffocate that voice. We should allow it to speak to us. Externally, through our teachers, through our seniors, through our friends and family, through our devotee associates, and internally, through the super soul within the heart. We can know, uh, I need to thank the gifts. Okay, so how do you know that you need forgiveness? Internally and externally, these two ways. Now, What are the main blockages for seeking forgiveness? And there are three things that I just want to mention here, but we're going to talk about them later on as we deal with how to forgive or how to get forgiveness. The three main blockages are anger, pride, and fear. Anger, because usually in a situation of seeking forgiveness, it's complicated, right? Like we saw in Jain Vijay. Yes, you've done something wrong for which you need to get forgiveness. But probably in that circumstance, they've done something wrong to you too. So there's some anger there that still we're festering, right? Because it's not a one-way street. It would actually be very easy if it was very one-way. I offended you. You were perfect in the situation. So I'm sorry. But usually it's not like that. I offend you, and then you offend me back, and now we're both in confusion. So anger is there, pride is there, but that's a big challenge. Um, how do I get myself to say sorry? It's tough, even, even, for, even for little kids. You can um, see at a certain age when the ego starts to manifest in a child, and it starts to become difficult for them to say sorry. They start to feel embarrassed about it. So, very natural thing that is prior to emerge, the ego. And thirdly, fear. Fear of what? Huh? Yes. What if I make all this effort to ask forgiveness and the person doesn't accept? The person says no. Or even not accepting, what if they crush me further? What if they smash me when I'm down? So we'll talk about these three things as obstacles in a minute. How do we seek forgiveness? Uh, we'll talk about the steps. Uh, just a couple of preludes to that. First, sometimes we have to apologize for things we did not do. Sometimes we have to apologize for more than what we did. <coughs> we did something this much. But in the situation, we have to apologize for this much, a lot more. And sometimes we have to apologize for side effects of our behavior that we did not intend. By saying this or doing this, I intended to do this. But the side effect was that when I said this to you, you went and said that to him, and he went and said that, that to her, and then that person got offended as a result of what they heard, 
and then one thing snowballed into another. And what you would like to do is apologize for what you did, which is I said something to you, so I want to apologize. Not for what happened over here, six you know, transfers later. But sometimes I have to apologize for things that were unintended effects of what I did. Right? Sometimes we have to apologize for things we did not do, or things we have to apologize for more than what we did, or sometimes we have to, have to apologize for side effects that we did not intend. In all of those circumstances, it's worth it. It's worth it. We do it, and then we move on. It's okay. It's okay. Even if we end up having to apologize for a little more than what we should have to. In the end, the winner is going to be us. The person who asks for forgiveness is always the winner. Whether or not the forgiveness is accepted, the forgiveness is given, whether or not the apology is accepted, the person who takes that step always comes out on top. Always the winner. Because our heart is clean. The Sudarshan Chakra is no longer chasing us. We can live peacefully. We can focus on our bhakti. We can go back to Godhead as a result of our humility. And that's real victory. That's real victory. Not the immediate circumstance. This little thing. I have to be right. And I'm not going to apologize for anything beyond this. Because that's what I did. That's it. Okay? But that's just this picture. That's just this little bit. If we think of it in the big picture, once we smooth out those relationships and things are peaceful again, our expression of devotion and humility we're, we're, we are headed back to God. Krishna right? is very pleased by that. And we come out the winners. Uh, Jai and Vijay's, their wholehearted apology, they came out the winner. Yes, temporarily they had to become demons. But they got to participate in Krishna's lila in a way that no one else did. In a very, very special way. And Krishna came personally to protect them. The other thing is that if we're going to do it, it's always better to do it sooner rather than later. It can take us time to get to a point where we feel ready to seek forgiveness. And that's okay. We can't force it on ourselves. But if we can push it a little bit, it's always better to do it quickly rather than slowly. Why? Because these things fester over time. They're like a wound that unless you stitch, it's going to go bigger and bigger, become more painful, you lose more blood. It just gets worse and worse. And sometimes the tension that's born from the mistake is worse than the mistake to begin with. Mm -hmm. Initially, had we apologized, it would have been over in a day or two. But then we waited six months, and in the meantime, a lot of things happened. Because I made this mistake towards you, and I didn't acknowledge it, so now, the next week, I can't really sit next to you during Prasad, because it's really awkward. And then, in the next meeting we have, uh, you say something a little nasty to me, because you're still hurting from what I said. And so I say something nasty back, which adds further to the wound that now I hate you even more, and you hate me even more. And then it snowballs like this. It gets worse and worse and worse. And six months later, it's this big of a problem. When it started off with something this small. Also, uh, swift apologies demonstrate our sincerity. Uh, when uh, Jain Vijay uh, were cursed, Bhagavatam says that they immediately fell down at the Kumara's feet and asked for forgiveness. And Srila Prabhupada explains in the purport that this was an accidental mistake on the part of Jain Vijay. It was not intentional. It was an accident. 
And how do you know it's an accident, he asks. Because as soon as they realized the mistake, they were like, oh, I'm so sorry. They immediately apologized. So it was, that's the evidence that, yeah, it was a genuine mistake. Like you didn't, it's just like if you're standing on someone's toe, right? you're in the subway or in a bus or something, and you're standing on someone's toe. As soon as the person says, ah, you're standing on my toe, what's your reaction? Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. And you move. Because why? It was an accident. If you were doing it on purpose, on the other hand, <laughs> you're stepping up. <laughs> you don't pay attention, right? You press a little bit harder. <laughs> so, our own sincerity is shown by that. Um, the fact that we apologize quickly means it was a genuine accident on our part. It didn't take us too much time. Okay, so. Um, how do we go about it? What are the steps uh, for making the apology? Uh, what, what, what is an effective way of asking for forgiveness? If we study Shrimad Bhagavatam and we look at all the many instances where forgiveness is asked and given, each time a person comes to ask forgiveness, Indra from Krishna, Brahma from Krishna, um, Durvasa from Amrish Maharaj. Each time, there's a certain formula that emerges. A, 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 a set of steps that if you look at them, and you look at them systematically, you say, oh, each time, this is what they're doing, and it's working. Bhagavatam gives us a model. Formula sounds too formulaic, so it's a <laughs> model. And Bhagavatam gives us a model for how we can ask for forgiveness. And these are the four steps that I've been able to glean from my own study. And maybe as you study Bhagavatam, you might see something else will emerge to you. But these things seem to come up consistently. Okay. Every time someone goes to apologize in Srimad Bhagavatam, do you know what is the first thing that they always do? Can you guess? Yeah. Glorify. Glorify. first thing they do is they express genuine appreciation for the person whom they are seeking forgiveness from, to whom they are apologizing. This is really important, very significant. Why? Because it immediately makes our, attention, our intentions very clear. That there is something good I see in you. What happens is in such situations, all we end up seeing is bad. When, when, you're, when you've been hurt by someone, or you've hurt someone, when you're in a tense relationship with someone, then what happens is you forget all the good that this person has, and you forget all the good times that you've shared with that person. They just kind of disappear in our memory. This, this happens <coughs> in arguments all the time. Some tension will arise and a person will say, yeah, they've always been like that. You know, from the start I knew <laughs> that he was just a horrible person. You remember 15 years ago, the first time I met him, the way he treated me? <laughs> and all of a sudden, the picture is whitewashed. Of not whitewashed, blackwashed, mm -hmm. of anything good in that person. And all the happy times you've spent having prashad with them and having good conversations and serving together, they just disappear. Oof, oh. So, by making, bringing some positivity into the conversation, it, it immediately allows, by giving some appreciation, it immediately allows for that positivity to just flow again. It immediately allows us to get back to recovering that relationship for what it was. Now, this requires a lot of humility. Uh, in a situation where everyone's been hurt, it's really tough to just 
come up and appreciate the other person. That, that requires some real humility of heart. Now, uh, humility is something we hear a lot about. Um, there's a famous verse from Chichitanya we should consider ourselves more humble than a blade of grass, more tolerant than a tree, ready to give all respect to others, expecting no respect in return. And oftentimes we hear something like that and we say, that's not for me. That's way too impractical. So I can pretend to offer obeisances to everyone, but really, if you become a straw in the street, you're asking me to become a doormat. Everyone wipes their feet on me, and then they walk in, and I'm just gonna take it. No, that's not what Mahaprabhu is asking, actually. Humility begins with something very simple. Humility begins from a place of honesty. And honesty means that we recognize ourselves for who we are. Both our faults, but also our good qualities, our strengths. That I have this to offer in Krishna's service. Why? Because Humility, when it's not genuinely felt, when it's artificial in nature, it, it just turns into groveling. It turns into flattery. At worst, it turns into low self-esteem. Low self-esteem means what? I have this capacity, this ability, but I don't recognize it. I don't think I'm worth anything. Even though everyone is telling me, no, you're good for this. You can do it. No, I don't think so. Low self-esteem and humility are two very different things. Here's the difference. Humility is a natural product of our focus on Krishna. When we are focused on Krishna, we look at Krishna and we think, he's so wonderful, he's so beautiful, he's so glorious, and who am I in front of the Lord? I'm so small. And as we think of Krishna more and more, we feel more and more inspired. And we feel ourselves smaller and smaller. Because our meditation on Krishna is so wonderful. Humility is focused on the Lord. Low self-esteem is focused on who? Us. It's about self-pity. It's about me. I'm the worst. I'm the lowest. I'm good for nothing. In fact, that kind of self-pity is just the flip side of pride. Why is pride so pleasing to us? Why does it feel so good to be proud of ourselves? Because we're focused on ourselves. It gives us an opportunity to think about me. I'm the best, I'm good at this, I'm like. But what does self-pity do? It's exactly the same thing, right? It gives us an opportunity to think about ourselves, to wallow in who we are. Except this time we're not great, we're really bad. But we're still focused on me. Still, still self-focused. This is why one time when, Bro, when one of Srila Prabhupada's disciples was telling Prabhupada, Srila Prabhupada, as Prabhupada was there, saying, I'm the most fallen, I need your mercy, I'm the lowest of the low, I'm the worst, please. And what did Prabhupada say? He said, you're not the most anything. You're not even the most fallen. Why? Because even the idea of I'm the most fallen is still focused on me, right? It's all about me. He could tell that in this devotee's mindset, this was not genuine. Narottam Das Thakur, he prays the same way. He says, 
He says, my dear Lord, your job is to deliver those who are patita, fallen. But let me tell you something. You will not find anyone more fallen than me. Therefore, my claim is first. He's speaking from a place of genuine humility. His humility is focused on Mahaprabhu and his mercy and who he is, not on himself. So this is the difference between pride and low self-esteem. Oh, sorry, humility and low self-esteem. Humility is focused on Krishna. Low self-esteem is focused on ourselves. And therefore, they have opposite effects. When we are humble, we feel inspired to serve Krishna and do more for Krishna. We think, Krishna is so wonderful. He's given so much to me, even though I don't deserve it. I'm tiny, and Krishna cares about me so much. A devotee feels grateful at heart. And that gratitude leads a devotee to say, I want to give back to Krishna. I want to do something to express my gratitude. Humility impels us towards more service, towards action, towards improving ourselves. Low self-esteem, on the other hand, it depresses a person. It makes them incapable. It incapacitates them. We think, oh, I can't do anything. I'm not good, good enough to do anything. Mm -hmm. So humility begins from a place of honesty. We recognize, no, I'm not the worst person on the planet. That award goes to someone else. I'm not the best either. That award goes to someone else. But these are my good points, and these are my struggles. And I have to accept that. I have to recognize that. So on a practical level, if we can just start there, at a place of honesty, and I could give many other examples, but we don't have time for that. But in Bhagavatam, we see that, especially in the story of Dhruva Maharaj. Dhruva Maharaj is very honest with his spiritual master now. He says, uh, not when he says, you go home after he's been offended, go home and be peaceful. And Dhurmai says, I understand that this is the best instruction, that I should give up my anger and my frustration. But I'm so sorry, I can't do that. I'm just not there yet. I, I don't have that kind of peace of mind. Please give me an instruction that I can follow, that I can handle. And so then Narmuni says, okay, you go and meditate on Vishnu and get what you want, which was the kingdom. So Dhruva was honest. I've got material desires. I have to deal with them. He didn't pretend to be like Prahlad. Prahlad took it all. He said, it's okay. If I want to be treated like this, I don't mind. I have full faith in Krishna's protection. But if Dhruva had tried that, he would have been destroyed. He would have been psychologically, emotionally, physically finished. So humility is not about becoming a doormat, letting everyone break our backs. It's about, no, recognizing, these are my limits, this is where I'm at, this is what I need to do to advance. Let me take the steps that are needed. And so the nicest, one of the easiest and most pleasant ways to begin our practice of humility is by Lord Chaitanya's verse describes many things uh, giving respect to others, not expecting return respecting return um, being more humble than the blade of grass but in my experience one of the easiest and most pleasant places to start is with manadena, giving respect to others the amanina part is a little difficult amanina means not expecting respect in return we all want to be recognized and appreciated, isn't it? I mean, this is human nature. We do something, even for Krishna, we want people to see that. We want people to recognize. Not a big, you know, like kirtan for us, but just <laughs> something, you know, like, okay, you did a nice job. We like that, and it's okay. And we can't get rid of that. But we can start with Manadeva, giving respect to others. 
that is a mutually rewarding thing. When you honor someone else, genuinely, you honor someone else, then the natural reaction of any sane human being is to reciprocate that honor with affection or honoring you in return. Isn't it? When someone comes to you and says, you know, you're, you, you just did that service in such a wonderful way. You're so good at it. What's our natural reaction? Uh, actually, I, I mean, wow, thank you, but, but you're the one I really admire for the same way that you do. Right? Or, or if we don't say that, at least we feel so much affection for that person. If we do mana dena, we give respect to others, then the mana always comes in return. It's a natural thing in this world. In fact, it is so natural that I would venture to say that it's true not even just in the devotee community, but even in the general world. People sometimes say, Trinata Pisunichena is impractical uh, for our world. It's a dog-eat-dog -dog world. And if I be humble at work, they'll, you know, I, they'll never get promoted. But that's because they're thinking humility means low self-esteem. They think humility means hiding your good characteristics. Means humility means saying, oh, I can't, I won't do that job, but you should do that job. No, you've been asked to do it, you can do it, so you should do it, right? It's okay if we're good at something to acknowledge that fact. That's the position of a madhyama adhikari, of a middle level devotee, which is a very good position to be in. Madhyama adhikari is able to see everyone's level of advancement. The nectar of instruction described that a madhyama adhikari can tell this person needs help. I should preach to them. This person is an advanced devotee. I should serve them. This person is God. I should worship him. Uh, Madhyamadika is able to make those distinctions. See the advancement of every person, including yourself. The only way you know that I can help this person is because you know you have the ability to help. Right? How can you preach unless you, if you don't think that you have anything to give? You cannot, right? So, that's not humility. Humility is actually very practical. I, my experience is that at, even at the workplace, if we offer genuine honor to others, as in genuinely we respect them, not flatter them, not grovel before them, but we appreciate them for something they've done well, people reciprocate by lifting us up. People naturally want to say, hey, I want that person on my team. Or, you know, I think they're ready for a promotion. They really show leadership qualities. Okay, there are a few people in this world who will take that opportunity to crush you and to damage you and all of that. There are just downright evil people in this world. That's a fact. <laughs> but, you know, they're few and far between and we shouldn't let them, you know, mess up our optimism about this world. <coughs> so, the first step in asking forgiveness is expressing appreciation to the other person. And the most important thing about expressing appreciation is being specific in our appreciation. That's how we know it's genuine. That's how that person knows it's genuine. Too often, our appreciation is full of platitudes. Oh, thank you so much. You're just a wonderful devotee. But why? What about this person did you actually like? We're used to expressing these platitudes so often to each other that we don't even take it seriously. It doesn't register. Because we, we, we hear it so often, these expressions. Oh, Prabhu, I'm, I'm your servant. Uh, you're, and we say, like, dear Prabhu, just the word Prabhu, right? You're my master. It's an expression of appreciation, but it's too general. And so we stop hearing it after a while. Platitudes, no one hears. This is why no one pays attention to speeches from politicians, because they're full of platitudes, <laughs> general statements, that no one could possibly ever disagree with. What we want to do to make sure an appreciation is heard is we make it specific. The prasadam was really good. But what about the prasadam was good? Was there a particular dish that you liked? 
Was there some spicing that was good? Was there a vegetable that you really enjoy, that is your favorite? And if you can't think of anything, then what were you saying when you were saying the prasadam is really good? <laughs> were we even paying attention to the food? Right? Means we're not eating consciously. We're not appreciating the effort that the person put into the food. So whenever we express appreciation, one of the things we see in Srimad Bhagavatam is that expression, appreciation is always expressed in specific ways. The devotee always tells Krishna, what exactly about you I like so much? And it really happens to be the kadamba flower that you put on your left ear. That's my favorite. You see praises of Krishna in Bhagavatam, they're so specific. His smile is like this, his teeth look like this. The earrings are what shape? Shark shaped. How many times have you read that? Shark shaped earrings. Means someone is paying attention to what kind of earrings Krishna has. Same thing when devotees exchange appreciation. If we want that appreciation to be heard, then we want to make it specific. We want to ask ourselves, what is it about it that we because the flip side is our criticism is always specific. Isn't it? We're very specific in our criticism. I really didn't like that thing you said. We won't go up to someone and say, I don't like the way you talk. No. We know that's useless. We say, I didn't like that thing you said. I felt bad about that. Or, this sabji has too much salt in it. That's a very specific criticism. We're not saying, the food is terrible. We never say that. We say, this sabji has too much salt in it. Why? Because it's effective. Next time, the person is going to be careful not to put more salt. It hits home. We make our criticisms very effective by making them specific. But when it comes to our appreciations, we make them blunt. We, we uh, sorry, uh, we not blunt. We make them dull. We, we, we don't make them sharp. We just make, turn it into platitudes. So what happens? People hear the criticism, they don't hear the appreciation. Mm -hmm. So that's the first step in asking for forgiveness. Is we start by giving genuine, and genuine means specific appreciation to the person whom we're going to ask forgiveness for. Second thing, we make a clear recognition of our mistake. We state very clearly what I'm apologizing for. Saying, I'm sorry, is usually not enough. Why? Because that person almost always wants to hear, what are you sorry about? And that's the tough part. Often it means, we say, I'm sorry that you felt that. <laughs> what is that saying? <laughs> it's you. You're the problem, right? I'm sorry that you felt that. <laughs> it would have been nicer had you not felt that. <laughs> but I'm sorry that you reacted in that way. Way too often apologies end up like that. Uh, people say something. This happens, again, in the political world all the time. Someone tweets out something nasty or horrible that offends a million people. And then they'll write back saying, uh, we are so sorry that all these people were hurt. We didn't intend that. That's not what the person is looking for. When you see an apology being made in the Bhagavad the apologizer will very specifically state, this is what I'm apologizing for. When Daksha comes to Lord Shiva to apologize, he's been through a lot. He's learned his lesson. He's now got the head of a goat. And if you don't know why or the story, you should definitely read this in Bhagavad Gita. It's one of the most amazing stories. But he's now speaking with the head of a goat. And he comes before Lord Shiva and he says, I am so sorry 
that I misunderstood your position as Mahadev. And I spoke ill words towards you. Please forgive me. When Brahma comes, when Indra comes before Krishna, they are specific in their apology. I am so sorry that I tried to harm your dear friends, the residents of Vrindavan. That's the one thing, right? Same thing with appreciation. That we're specific about the apology. We're clear what we're apologizing for. And number two, that there's no conditions attached. There's no ifs and buts. I'm so sorry I said that to you. Now, it is true that you overreacted. But, you know, <laughs> but I'm sorry. All you, you put in all that effort to apologize. It takes a lot to ask forgiveness. You created the situation, you met face to face with them, and then you lost the opportunity. You just blew it. Why? Because the effect is now completely gone. As soon as we add conditions to it, ifs and buts and could have been like that, and making the apology unconditional is, the, is very, very significant. Indra doesn't come to Krishna and say, I'm so sorry I put all those reins on the people of Vrindavan, but really you shouldn't have said all that to me <laughs> because you knew it would get me upset when you were stopping my yagya. I mean, really, did you have to do that? You could, didn't your father suggest that they could do an additional yagya for both of them? That would have been a good solution. I get my yagya, you get yours. He didn't say all of that. Had he said it, his apology would have been useless, practically speaking. He just came and gave a simple, clear apology. I'm sorry I did this to the people of the body. So, the one thing that we can add to our apology, the one thing that we can add, not ifs and buts and conditions, but clarification of our intention, that actually does help. I am so sorry I said this. What I meant to say was this, but I made a mistake. Clarifying intentions, whether the intentions are good or bad, is very, very powerful. It really, sometimes, so usually we clarify our intentions when those intentions are good. Uh, to say, I didn't actually mean to hurt you, but this is what I meant to do. And that's helpful when we clarify intentions. But sometimes, stating ill intentions can be even more powerful. If someone comes before you and says, I'm sorry I said that to you, the only reason I said it was actually, I was just feeling a little jealous. You're so well qualified and you do so, and I, I just felt envious. If someone comes out and clarifies their intention, that is, bears some anartha within their heart, it's very powerful. That person practically has no choice but to forgive. Like, I, I thought I would have to tell you how envious you are, but you're saying it? You're, you're the most humble person I've, I've met. It, it transforms how we see that person. When someone owns up, again, that point of honesty, right? When we are honest with our intentions. And one a very beautiful example of this in Srila Bhagavatam, very beautiful, is when after Krishna comes, kills Hiranyakashipu and Hiranyaksha. Hiranyakashipu and Hiranyaksha sons of Diti, right? She's the mother of the demons. And Krishna kills them, then Diti is really upset. And she goes to Kashyapa, her husband, and says, please give me some vrata I can do, some religious ceremony I can do, that I will have a son who will kill him. And Kashyapa doesn't want to, but he gives her this vrata that she can do. And it's called um, I think it's called a biogram. 
and uh, <coughs> and uh, he says, if you do this perfectly, it's a very complicated but like, eat at this time, don't eat, eat at this time, just drink milk and like that. Very difficult. He says, if you do this, then um, uh, you'll get a son who will kill Indra. Uh, but if you even make one little mistake, which Kashyapa is hoping actually she will, <laughs> then you will get a, a son who will be Indra's friend. So off she goes, does the brata. Indra hears about this and he thinks, I have to stop this. This is, could, could be my death. And so he comes to Diti while she's doing the vrata. And part of the vrata is to not have, uh, to not be, have hatred for others, right? So he comes at this time when she's taken this vow to be nice, essentially, and asks to help her, to assist her in her vrata. She prepares the different food ingredients that she needs and the arti paraphernalia and all of that. She gets, he gets things ready and serves her nicely. Again and again. Uh, this uh, he does for months and months and months. But what he's looking out for is the one moment that she's going to slip up. Because he knows that when she slips up, his plan is to destroy the child within the womb. And sure enough, one evening, she has her food and she forgets to wash her mouth, something like that, before she goes to bed. She goes, falls asleep. And when she's asleep, in the nose, I've caught her making a mistake. He enters within her womb and chops up the child within her womb, who's going to be his enemy. It's a seven pieces. To his surprise, the, the child doesn't die. Rather, the one child becomes seven children. And each of the seven start to cry. And so then he panics and he chops up each one of the seven into seven more pieces. And now it's 49. And all 49 begin to cry and say, Indra, why are you killing us? We are your friends, we're your followers. And Indra realizes, oops, this was a mistake. He comes out and also come out the 49, so she gives birth. <laughs> at that point. And she's really shocked and surprised. She says, what happened? I had one child, now I've got 49. And where did this come from? And Indra, what were you doing inside me? And all of these things. And at that point, something really amazing happens. Diti sees these children, who are good children. They're actually, the Maruts become devas. Diti becomes the mother of some demigods, not just the demons. They become devas. And she sees these good children, and she tells Indra, she says, I'm so sorry. I was actually doing this whole brata to kill you, Indra. That was my intention. And I really shouldn't have been doing that. I apologize for that. She expresses her intention. And Indra says, well, uh, I wasn't really here trying to serve you either. My intentions weren't clean either. I was actually here waiting for you to make a mistake so I could kill the child. And I went inside trying to kill your kids, and that's why you have 49 instead of one. And when that exchange happens, Prabhupada explained in the purport that the two expressing their intentions so genuinely to each other. In fact, I, I think I might. Yeah, Prabhupada says this. He says, when Diti, Indra's aunt, explained to Indra without reservations what she had wanted to do, Indra explained his intentions to her. Thus, both of them, instead of being enemies, freely spoke the truth. This is the qualification that results from contact with Vishnu. So this is the hope that we have as devotees. When we make that apology, if we state our intentions, the fact that we're stating those intentions to someone else who's a devotee of the Lord, they too come clean with their intentions. And when that happens, then the rift is healed. Even something so significant as Indra and Diti's fight 
was purified. It was cleansed. So, when we state our mistake, three things. One is, we make a specific statement of what we did wrong. Number two, we have no conditions attached, except stating our intention. That's the only thing that's actually good to add. And then thirdly, we suggest some remedy. What can I do to fix the situation, to make things better, recompense? And we'll talk about suggesting remedies a little bit later, uh, how to do that and what the ways are, okay? So, first step was what? In hmm? genuine appreciation. Second step is recognizing or stating our mistake. And that had three steps inside. Right? Recognizing our mistake means we state it specifically, we don't attach any conditions to it, and we suggest a remedy to fix the situation. Now, we've recognized our mistake. Now what? The third thing is feeling genuinely remorseful. Now, this is not the same thing as recognizing your mistake or stating your mistake. Recognizing that we've done something wrong and feeling bad about it, feeling remorseful, are two different things. Very often, see, human beings have this incredible power of justification, of justifying our actions. And we can acknowledge a mistake. Yes, I did something wrong. And then we can justify it in a hundred ways. I did something wrong, but I, I was really stressed out. You know, it was, I had a really hard day that day, and this person just caught me at the wrong time. Or, I did something wrong, but, you know, that person actually provoked me. They did something to provoke me. What do you expect? I did something wrong, but, yes, it was wrong, but <coughs> frankly, they overreacted. I did something wrong, but, and we've got a hundred different explanations for why what we did wrong actually makes sense under the circumstances. Means what? There is recognition of the mistake, but no remorse. And it's precisely the feeling of remorse that purifies us of the offense, that cleanses our heart. Shri Prabhupada explains that when Parikshit Maharaj saw, recognized what he did, he came home after putting the snake on Shamik Rishi's neck, he came home and he felt so bad about what he did. And Prabhupada explained in the purport that it's the fire of remorse that cleanses the heart of the devotee and purifies us from the offense that we make. In fact, I, I have the, uh, the quote here. He says, um, The pious king regretted his accidental, improper treatment of the powerful Brahman, who was faultless. Such repentance is natural for a good man like the king. And such repentance delivers a devotee from all kinds of sins accidentally committed. The devotees are naturally faultless. Accidental sins committed by a devotee are sincerely regretted, and by the grace of the Lord, all sins unwillingly committed by a devotee are burnt in the fire of repentance. Here, you, you, you see what he's saying? By the grace of the Lord, all sins, sins unwillingly committed by a devotee are burnt in the fire of repentance. If we want to get rid of that heavy heart, if we want to make our heart lighter, then by feeling genuine repentance, Oh, in the list of justifications that we come up with, one I forgot to mention. Besides, oh, they overreacted, or I was stressed out, or having a bad day, or whatever. One justification that we sometimes use is, 
yes, I made a mistake, that was strong, but I'm their senior, and they're my junior, <laughs> and therefore it's okay. <laughs> or that's what was necessary to help them learn a lesson. They needed to hear it. This was Shingi's problem. Shingi, when he just when he utters that curse, he recognizes the mistake, and then he tries to justify it. And how does he justify it? He says, "I'm a Brahmin. He's a Kshatriya. The Brahmins are the gurus of the Kshatriyas. How dare they come and offend us like this? I have to teach him a lesson. He will remember. I'm senior." You're junior. I deserve to do this. It's in my right. I can speak harshly because, after all, I'm twice your age. It's another form of justification where that remorse isn't there. And the funny thing is, Shingi justified himself, but did he feel peaceful at heart? No. He still came to his father and the crowd. He didn't know what to do. He still didn't feel good. It made sense intellectually. I've got this all worked out, why I gave the curse. But it didn't feel good here. So that's in chapter was still chasing it. Okay, so we feel genuine repentance, okay? And then the final step is the real test. The real test that we're actually seeking forgiveness is that we make some recompense. We change our behavior. We try to mend our ways that I will not do it again. We make an active effort to improve. Uh, you know when Jaga and Madhai were such sinful persons, when they threw that bottle or pot at got him to bleed. And Lord Chaitanya was so angry, he brought out the Sudarshan Chakra and ready to kill them. And they fell at Mahaprabhu's feet. And then at Nityananda Prabhu's feet and begged for forgiveness. And Nityananda Prabhu told Mahaprabhu, please forgive them. Mahaprabhu said, I will forgive them. But, what did they have to promise? Don't commit these things. Don't continue with this intellective. And one of the nicest ways of making recompense, one of the most effective ways, is just to try to serve the person whom we offend, whom we need forgiveness from. We offer our service to them. Or we assist them in their service to Krishna. And this is what Prabhupada said with Indra and Diti. It's because Indra assisted Diti, he served Diti, he lost his ill feelings towards her. His Prabhupada says, this is the qualification that results from contact with Vishnu. When we help that person serve Krishna, we see their good qualities and our heart becomes genuinely cleansed. It becomes genuinely peaceful. So we find a way to serve them. Sometimes it can be just Something as simple as saying, please come to our home for prasad. And genuinely, we try to make them happy. We try to please them. Or it can mean, this is what I did wrong. Let me try to fix what I did wrong. Let me try to make it better. I'll do this to make things right. Or it can mean, this seva is important for you. Let me try to help you in your seva. Okay? So four things. Genuine appreciation, a clear, specific, unconditional recognition of our mistake, feeling genuinely remorseful, and finally, taking active steps to, um, norm, yeah, to not do that again. Okay? So, I think we should take a break here. Um, we're a little bit behind schedule. Uh, still have to talk about the other side, uh, which is 
how to forgive, uh, which frankly is just as difficult as asking for forgiveness, saying sorry, just as difficult is actually accepting that apology and forgiving. When we've been hurt, to forgive is very, very difficult. It's challenging. So it's very important, but I think we need to take a break. So let's take come back at, at um, 5 o'clock, so a 10-minute break, and then we'll go for an hour. Um, just a quick logistic announcement. We see some guests in here for the first time. Please you know where the bathrooms are, just through the doors. Uh, the first bathroom on your left is the women's bathroom, and then the next bathroom is the, ne is the men's bathroom. Um, then we'll, we'll reconvene at 5 o'clock, and people will go on until like 30 ish or so. Well, the time that was given to me was 6. Um, I'll try to finish it in one hour if I can. Okay. So charge through. But I also want to give some time for questions. So sure. I don't know if, if devotees are willing, we can go until 6 30. Yeah, if we had Kirtan after 6, from like 6 to 6 30, Kirtan and Prashadam at 6 30, so we can read by it. But I just want to make sure the devotees that well, we have Prashadam after the program. So there's dinner Prashadam that's going to be served here after we finish the second session. And the only thing that stands between you and Prashad is me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.